maternal collapse in pregnancy and the puerperium. Green Top Guideline Number 56, January 2011. Purpose and Scope Maternal collapse is a rare but life-threatening event with a wide-ranging etiology. The outcome, primarily for the mother but also for the fetus, depends on prompt and effective resuscitation. Background and Introduction Maternal collapse is defined as an acute event involving the cardiorespiratory systems and or brain resulting in a reduced or absent conscious level and potentially death at any stage in pregnancy and up to six weeks after delivery. The incidence of maternal collapse or severe maternal morbidity is unknown as morbidity data are not routinely collected. A woman is defined as having had a severe maternal morbidity event if there is a risk of maternal death without timely intervention. The data from UK Obstetric Surveillance System, or UKOSS, showed a severe maternal morbidity rate of 6 over 1,000 or 600 over 100,000 maternities. In the last trinium in the UK, the maternal mortality rate was 14 over 100,000 births. But again, not all maternal deaths are preceded by maternal collapse. Thus, the true rate of maternal collapse lies somewhere between 0.14 and 6 over 1,000 or 14 and 600 over 100,000 births. As it is such a rare event with potentially devastating consequences, it is essential that caregivers are skilled in initial effective resuscitation techniques and are able to investigate and diagnose the cause of the collapse to allow appropriate, directed continuing management. Unfortunately, in reports regarding morbidity and in the confidential inquiry into maternal and child health report, areas of substandard care continue to be identified, including poor resuscitation skills, but it should also be remembered that death and disability may result despite excellent care. It should be noted that vasovagal attacks and the postictal state following an epileptic seizure are the most common causes of maternal collapse. Clinical issues. Can women at risk of impending collapse be identified early? An obstetric early warning score chart should be used routinely for all women to allow early recognition of the woman who is becoming critically ill. In some cases, maternal collapse occurs with no prior warning, although there may be existing risk factors that make this more likely. Antenatal care for women with significant medical conditions at risk of maternal collapse should include multidisciplinary team input with a pregnancy and delivery management plan in place. Often, there are clinical signs that precede collapse. The first early warning scoring or EWS systems were introduced on the basis that a deterioration in simple physiological vital signs will precede significant clinical deterioration and that early intervention will reduce morbidity. Despite this, EWS systems have not been demonstrated to be highly effective even when their use has triggered input from a specialized medical emergency team and although their use is recommended by the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, or NICE, this is based on informal consensus rather than evidence. The physiological changes of pregnancy may render the existing EWS systems inappropriate and no validated system for use in the pregnant women currently exist. What are the causes of maternal collapse? There are many causes of collapse, and this may be pregnancy-related or result from conditions not related to pregnancy and possibly existing before pregnancy. Systematic consideration of the causes of collapse can enable skilled rescuers to identify the cause of collapse in the hospital setting and where the cause is reversible, survival can be improved.
The common reversible causes of collapse in any woman can be remembered using the well-known aid memoir employed by the Resuscitation Council of UK of the 4Ts and the 4H, hemorrhage. This is the most common cause of maternal collapse. Major obstetric hemorrhage has an estimated incidence of 3.7 over 1,000 maternities. Causes of major obstetric hemorrhage include postpartum hemorrhage, major antepartum hemorrhage from placenta previa or accreta, placental abruption, uterine rupture, and ectopic pregnancy. In most cases of massive hemorrhage leading to collapse, the cause is obvious, but concealed hemorrhage should not be forgotten, including following cesarean section and ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Other rarer causes of concealed hemorrhage include splenic artery rupture and hepatic rupture. Blood loss is often underestimated, especially slow, steady bleeding, and fit healthy women can tolerate significant loss prior to showing signs of decompensation. Thromboembolism Appropriate use of thromboprophylaxis has improved maternal morbidity and mortality, but improvements in clinical risk assessment and prophylaxis are still required. Amniotic fluid embolism The estimated frequency of amniotic fluid embolism, or AFE, lies somewhere between 1.25 over 100,000 and 12.5 over 100,000 maternities, with the most recent UK data giving an incidence of 2 over 100,000 maternities. Survival rates seem to have improved significantly over time, although neurological morbidity in survivors is well recognized. The perinatal mortality rate in cases of AFE is 135 over 1,000 total births. AFE presents as collapse during labor or delivery or within 30 minutes of delivery in the form of acute hypotension, respiratory distress, and acute hypoxia. Seizures and cardiac arrest may occur. There are different phases to disease progression, which clearly impacts on maternal survival. Initially, pulmonary hypertension may develop secondary to vascular occlusion either by debris or by vasoconstriction. This often resolves and left ventricular dysfunction or failure develops. Coagulopathy often develops if the mother survives long enough, often giving rise to massive postpartum hemorrhage. If amniotic fluid embolism occurs prior to delivery, profound fetal distress develops acutely. The underlying pathophysiological process has been compared to anaphylaxis or severe sepsis. Diagnosis in non-fatal cases is clinical as there is no established accurate diagnostic test pre-mortem. Cardiac disease Cardiac disease was the most common overall cause of maternal death. The majority of deaths secondary to cardiac causes occur in women with no previous history. The main cardiac causes of death are myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, and cardiomyopathy. The incidence of primary cardiac arrest in pregnancy is much rarer at around 1 over 30,000 maternities, and most cardiac events have preceding signs and symptoms. Aortic root dissection can present in otherwise healthy women, and signs and symptoms such as central chest or interscapular pain, a wide pulse pressure, mainly secondary to systolic hypertension, and a new cardiac murmur must prompt referral to a cardiologist and appropriate imaging. The incidence of congenital and rheumatic heart disease in pregnancy is increasing secondary to increase survival rates owing to improved management of congenital heart disease and increased immigration. These cases should be managed by an appropriately skilled and experienced multidisciplinary team, usually in regional centers. Other cardiac causes include dissection of the coronary artery, acute left ventricular failure, infective endocarditis, 
and pulmonary edema. Sepsis Sepsis has been recognized for centuries as a significant cause of maternal morbidity and mortality, and substandard care continues to feature in the cases that result in death. Bacteremia, which can be present in the absence of pyrexia or a raised white cell count, can progress rapidly to severe sepsis and septic shock, leading to collapse. The most common organisms implicated in obstetrics are the streptococcal groups A, B, and D, Eumococcus, and Escherichia coli. Drug toxicity or drug overdose Drug toxicity or overdose should be considered in all cases of collapse, and illicit drug overdose should be remembered as a potential cause of collapse outside of hospital. In terms of therapeutic drug toxicity, the common sources in obstetric practice are magnesium sulfate in the presence of renal impairment and local anesthetic agents injected intravenously by accident. Toxic effects associated with local anesthetics usually result from excessively high plasma concentrations. Effects initially include a feeling of inebriation and lightheadedness followed by sedation, circumoral paresthesia and twitching, convulsions can occur in severe toxicity. On intravenous injection, convulsions and cardiovascular collapse may occur very rapidly. Local anesthetic toxicity resulting from systemic absorption of the local anesthetic may occur sometime after the initial injection. Signs of severe toxicity include sudden loss of consciousness, with or without tonic-clonic convulsions and cardiovascular collapse, sinus bradycardia, conduction blocks, asystole, and ventricular tachyarrhythmias can all occur. In terms of local anesthetics, total spinal block or high spinal or epidural block are rare and usually easily recognize causes of collapse. Eclampsia Eclampsia as the cause of maternal collapse is usually obvious in the inpatient setting. Epilepsy should always be considered in cases of maternal collapse associated with seizure activity. Intracranial hemorrhage Intracranial hemorrhage is a significant complication of uncontrolled, particularly systolic, hypertension, but can also result from ruptured aneurysms and arteriovenous malformations. The initial presentation may be maternal collapse, but often severe headache precedes this. Anaphylaxis Anaphylaxis is a severe, life-threatening, generalized, or systemic hypersensitivity reaction resulting in respiratory, cutaneous, and circulatory changes and possibly gastrointestinal disturbance and collapse. There is significant intravascular volume redistribution which can lead to decreased cardiac output. Acute ventricular failure and myocardial ischemia may occur. Upper airway occlusion secondary to angioedema, bronchospasm, and mucus plugging of smaller airways all contribute to significant hypoxia and difficulties with ventilation. Common triggers are a variety of drugs, latex, animal allergens, and foods. The incidence is between 3 and 10 over 1,000 with a mortality rate of around 1%. Anaphylaxis is likely when all of the following three criteria are met. Sudden onset and rapid progression of symptoms, life-threatening airway and or breathing and or circulation problems, skin and or mucosal changes like flushing, urticaria, and angioedema. Exposure to a known allergen for the woman supports the diagnosis but many cases occur with no previous history. Mass cell tryptase levels can be useful. Other causes of maternal collapse include hyperglycemia and other metabolic or electrolyte disturbances. Other causes of hypoxia such as airway obstruction secondary to aspiration or foreign body, air embolism, tension pneumothorax, 
cardiac tamponade secondary to trauma and hypothermia. Figure number 1. Causes of maternal collapse. What are the physiological and anatomical changes in pregnancy that affect a resuscitation? It is essential that anyone involved in the resuscitation of pregnant women is aware of the physiological differences. This includes paramedics and emergency room staff. The pregnant woman undergoes a variety of physiological changes that accelerate the development of hypoxia and acidosis and make ventilation more difficult. The cardiovascular changes also promote rapid blood loss and reduce oxygen carrying capacity. These changes are listed in table number one and combined with other physical changes make resuscitation during pregnancy more challenging. It is essential that anyone involved in the resuscitation of a pregnant woman is aware of these differences. This includes paramedics and emergency room staff. Aortocaval compression. Aortocaval compression significantly reduces cardiac output from 20 weeks of gestation onwards. From around 20 weeks of gestation onwards, in the supine position, the gravid uterus can compress the inferior vena cava and aorta to a much lesser extent, thus reducing venous return, and as a consequence, cardiac output by up to 30 to 40% causing what is known as supine hypotension. Supine hypotension itself can precipitate maternal collapse, which is usually reversed by turning the woman into the left lateral position. Aortocaval compression significantly reduces the efficacy of chest compressions during resuscitation. When cardiopulmonary arrest occurs, chest compressions are needed to produce cardiac output. In non-pregnant women, chest compression achieve around 30% of the normal cardiac output. Aortocaval compression further reduces cardiac output to around 10% that achieved in non-pregnant women. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR is less likely to be effective in a woman who is 20 weeks pregnant or more. Table number 1 Physiological and Physical Changes in Pregnancy Respiratory changes. Changes in lung function, diaphragmatic splinting, and increased oxygen consumption make the pregnant women become hypoxic more readily and make ventilation more difficult. The increased progesterone level in pregnancy increases the respiratory drive, leading to an increase in tidal volume and minute ventilation. Splinting of the diaphragm by the enlarged uterus reduces the functional residual capacity, and also makes ventilation more difficult. These factors, along with the markedly increased oxygen consumption of the fetoplacental unit, mean that the pregnant woman becomes hypoxic much more rapidly during periods of hypoventilation. Intubation Difficult intubation is more likely in pregnancy. Weight gain in pregnancy large breasts inhibiting the working space, and laryngeal edema can all contribute to make intubation more difficult. Aspiration Pregnant women are at an increased risk of aspiration. The pregnant woman is at a significantly higher risk of regurgitation and aspiration secondary to the progesterone effect, relaxing the lower esophageal sphincter and delayed gastric emptying along with the raised intra-abdominal pressure, secondary to the gravid uterus. Aspiration pneumonitis in the pregnant women, known as Mendelssohn syndrome, can be severe, 
particularly as the gastric pH is lower than in the non-pregnant population. Early intubation with effective cricoid pressure and the use of histamine 2 receptor antagonists and antacids prophylactically in all women considered to be at high risk of obstetric intervention during labor is advised. Circulation the increased cardiac output and hyperdynamic circulation of pregnancy mean that large volumes of blood can be lost rapidly, especially from the uterus, which receives 10% of the cardiac output at term. Otherwise, healthy women tolerate blood loss remarkably well and can lose up to 35% of their circulation before becoming symptomatic. Blood loss is tolerated less well if there is a pre-existing maternal anemia and clotting is less efficient if there is a significant anemia. Concealed bleeding and underestimation of loss mean that the intervention is often delayed. Where signs of hypovolemia have been subtle, hypovolemia as the cause of maternal cardiopulmonary arrest may go unrecognized, particularly where blood loss has been concealed. What is the optional initial management of maternal collapse? Maternal resuscitation should follow the Resuscitation Council UK guidelines using the standard A, B, and C approach with some modification. In the community setting, basic life support should be administered and rapid transfer arranged unless appropriate personnel and equipment are available. In the pregnant women of 20 weeks or more gestation, adaptations are made to the resuscitation process. There are essential adaptations to the management of the collapsed pregnant women because of the physiological and anatomical changes of pregnancy. Tilt From 20 weeks of gestation onwards, the pressure of the gravid uterus must be relieved from the inferior vena cava and aorta. A left lateral tilt of 15 degrees on a firm surface will relieve aortocaval compression in the majority of pregnant women and still allow effective chest compressions to be performed. A left lateral tilt of 15 degrees can be achieved on an operating table using a Cardiff wedge by having someone kneel on the right side of the woman with their knees under the woman's thorax. In cases of major trauma, the wedge should be placed under the spinal board. In the absence of a spinal board, manual displacement of the uterus should be used. Using soft surfaces such as bed or objects such as pillows or blankets is not nearly as effective and compromises effective chest compressions but is better than leaving the woman supine. Airway the airway should be protected as soon as possible by intubation with a cuffed endotracheal tube. In pregnancy, the airway is more vulnerable because of the increased risk of regurgitation and aspiration. For this reason, it is important to clear and protect the airway as early as possible. Intubation should then be performed as soon as possible. This will protect the airway, ensure good oxygen delivery, and facilitate more efficient ventilation. Intubation should then be performed as soon as possible. This will protect the airway, ensure good oxygen delivery, and facilitate more efficient ventilation. It should be emphasized that the pregnant woman is more likely to regurgitate and aspirate in the absence of a secured airway, tracheal tube, than the non-pregnant patient and that the early involvement of an appropriately skilled anesthetist remains best practice. Breathing Supplemental oxygen should be administered as soon as possible. Because of the increased oxygen requirements and rapid onset of hypoxia in pregnancy, it is important to ensure optimal oxygen delivery by adding high-flow 100% oxygen to whatever method of ventilation is being employed. Bag and mask ventilation should be undertaken until intubation can be achieved.